How's everybody doing? Happy day two. Good. I went to South Beach this morning and had a Cubano coffee, and so I am just ready to go. I'm caffeinated. So, I'd like to start um, this session and today by beginning with a land acknowledgement statement. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land in which we are gathering here today is indigenous land of the Tequesta, Calusa, Seminole, and Makusuki people, acknowledging Florida's land, peninsula's ancestral and unceded territory as the traditional stewards of the land is an important step to repairing relationships as we work to equitable and inclusive resilience. So today we give honor, respect to past, present, future generations of these sovereign native nations. Thank you. So my name is Meredith Hovis. I'm the former executive director of SCDRP, um, and I'm now a postdoc at the University of Arizona Udall Center for Studies in Public Policy, and I'm studying drought resilience, nature-based solutions, and water governance. So I'm thrilled to moderate this session today on rapid recovery between serial disasters. In this session, we'll hear from four speakers across very different and diverse sectors. Um, and then I'll take all questions Q&A at the end of all of our speakers. We'll open it up for the audience um, questions. The objectives of this session are to understand lessons learned post-disaster. In the Southeast and Caribbean, we are seeing shorter recovery intervals where time between disasters are shortening. We are seeing disasters become more intense and more frequent. And as we try to rebuild and recover from one hazard, we are hit by another hazard. So in this session, we will hear about a few different efforts that are available in the recovery phase, especially for those communities in under-resourced and traditionally marginalized communities. So first we have up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Gavin Smith, who is a professor in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning at NC State University. He has experience in disaster resilience and author of Planning for Post-Disaster Recovery, a review of the U.S. Disaster Assistant Framework. So thank you, Gavin. Hey. So Meredith didn't mention she was a former student of mine. Really proud of her. <laughs> uh, postdoc doing great work. Uh, so Meredith, it's good to see you again. We were just talking. Actually, I hadn't seen her ever in person, I don't think, because we met during COVID, and so we've been meeting via Zoom. And she said she thought I was a lot shorter. I don't know what that, <laughs> what that means. Uh, let's see. So the slides, are we able to get those up? Yeah, I just, actually, that's the. Gavin, Gavin Smith, yep. Move them forward. No. I gave you the slides uh, yesterday. It should say DTA in all capitals in there somewhere. It's probably my name. Okay. Okay. We can adapt. That's fine. Yeah. I can, actually, uh, I can sing. Um, actually, I'm quite good at karaoke. I did a lot of that in Korea. So I, and if you sing with me, we'll do it in Korea. I can, we can do Korean folk songs. So if you're going to call me out, I may, you know, I'll come right back at you. So. I can tell Meredith stories. You know, I, don't know, I don't really have anything embarrassing on Meredith, but uh, she was such a good student, always focused. Well, uh, so the book that was referenced is, uh, it was an assessment of disaster recovery, uh, looking at the role of land use planning and governance. How do we do a better job of drawing from, uh, or looking at long-term disaster recovery as more than a governmental activity. Uh, linking up nonprofit organizations, foundations, corporations, you know, you name it, and how planning could play a role in, in dealing with those kinds of issues. So, yeah, you might wanna, yeah, and there we go. Here we are, I better get going, because I'm already behind. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks for your attention. Actually, I just saw Brock walked in the room. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. 
I'm really interested in hearing your feedback on this. This is something that, uh, that Brock and FEMA had been working on. I'm going to talk about uh, building resilient infrastructure and communities grant program, but also uh, other activities. And uh, my presentation, while it's not explicitly tied to disaster recovery, it's really on the front end and what we can do as universities uh, to do a better job of empowering uh, under-resourced communities. And so this is a grant that I've received from FEMA uh, to look at how we do that. How do we provide direct technical assistance uh, to help communities deal with issues associated with BRIC and, and other activities, which I'll talk about in just a moment. This is the research team, myself, uh, Chilean Pasilar, uh, Josh uh, Human from FEMA, as well as the research assistants uh, that, are, that are working with me on this project. So one of the things that we found in our own research, but also FEMA has understood, is that one of the real challenges that under-resourced communities are facing is how do they uh, develop and implement BRIC grants? Uh, how do they write hazard mitigation plans and resilience plans? How do they conduct risk assessments? Uh, and this is a fundamental challenge. BRIC is, it's a, uh, I think it's a great idea, it's a great program, but it's really complicated and it's tough to administer. And so what we're going to be doing is uh, we are going to assess how universities can play a greater role in, in assisting and complementing uh, some of the resources that are already being provided to include developing and implementing BRIC grants, writing hazard mitigation plans, climate resilience plans, as well as risk assessments. So this is the current uh, direct technical assistance model. I'm not going to ex explain it in great detail, but suffice it to say, if you look in the bottom kind of left-hand quadrant, uh, we are going to be assessing what universities can do to complement uh, the provision of direct technical assistance, everything from benefit cost analysis to writing grants, to helping implement grants, to even looking at open space management following large-scale acquisition of hazard-prone housing, among other activities. What we're proposing and what we're just starting on, this, is, this project has just started, it's a year-long project, but we are thinking through how universities, particularly land-grant universities, and engage faculty and engagement experts, as well as students, uh, can assist and complement the work that FEMA regional staff, contractors, uh, and other organizations are developing. We're also exploring the idea of reaching out to other universities that can assist. And I should say that land-grant universities, as all of you know in this room, Sea Grant is a vital partner in that. And so we're really interested in teaming up with Sea Grant, groups like the Extension Disaster Education Network, could be centers, I've talked to many of you already, different centers and institutes that have university faculty embedded in them that are really interested in community engagement. Could be professional organizations and others, and so I, I'm, I'm really interested in hearing from you about those types of issues. So how are we going to do this? One is the ultimate goal is to develop a nationwide university and network, and I'll explain that in just a moment. But we also want to assess how well it could do this work. Uh, we want to figure out and work with FEMA how to institutionalize this, and then even develop a mechanism by which we train faculty, engagement scholars, and students, which are ultimately are going to be the next generation of practitioners and working with these communities, uh, how to do this kind of work. So these are some of the broad goals that we're going to be doing, and we're starting this um, actually in, in the next uh, week or so, is we're going to be interviewing university experts that have already written award-winning BRIC grants, have written hazard mitigation plans and so forth. We're going to be conducting um, focus groups to look at this as well, and we really want to find out those, who are the people that not only are technical experts, but those that are willing and committed to do this. Uh, as you know, to write a BRIC grant, to implement a BRIC grant, to write or implement a, a buyout program can take years. And so we've got to come up with a mechanism so it's not just faculty parachuting into a community and then dropping out. And that's one of the ongoing problems with the university setting. I'll be critical of our own network. We often drop in, we're extractive, we collect data, publish papers, and then leave. So we don't want to do that. Uh, we're going to be also conducting, and this is, I'll, I'll get to this in just a moment, but we're going to be conducting a national survey of faculty and engagement people around the country. And the first thing is we've got to find them. So this is one of the first steps to do that is to actually let you know what we're doing. Uh, and in that survey, we're going to be assessing their capabilities. We're going to be assessing what is it they need to succeed uh, and so forth. That's going to be used to create a national network or a cadre of, a, of faculty uh, and engagement experts. And then we're going to develop a framework to institutionalize that. This is a, you may not be able to see that on the left, is a list of all land-grant universities and minority-serving institutions. On the right is direct technical assistance being delivered in this current calendar year for BRIC. 
don't worry about the details, but this is the network that we're looking at. We're looking to identify faculty, engagement folks, and students in this network to start. Uh, so it's a very large effort. Uh, and we don't, we're not even sure how many there will be. There could be hundreds, there could be thousands, we hope. So what we're doing, uh, we're doing, we're starting interviews with, like I said, people that have written award-winning grants at universities. We are going to be doing focus groups to understand in greater depth what it's going to take to succeed. Um, we're going to be doing this national survey to find out who they are, what skills they have, what they don't possess, uh, and then we're going to use that to identify and create this national cadre. And so my question uh, in the room, kind of opening the question, uh, is, you know, people in the room, are you interested in this endeavor? Uh, are you a member of a land-grant university, minority-serving institution, C-grant, could be another university, are you interested in this uh, endeavor? Um, you know, have you assisted communities do this work, writing BRIC grants, writing hazard mitigation plans, conducting risk assessments, and might you be committed to doing something like that? As I said, it's not just the technical expertise, that's good to know, but we've got to have people that are also committed, and that's why I'm thinking of land-grant universities, because that's embedded in our mission, but there could be other university faculty that are interested in this issue. So, we want you, we want you to participate uh, in this effort. And so what we've set up is we've set up a link or a site that you can basically enter uh, and sign up and say, this is my name, uh, here's my email, uh, if you have a website or some organization, if it's available, and just bulletize list of your relevant experience. Because you know, the, the only way this is gonna succeed is if we find people that are all over the country They're going to be embedded, ultimately, we think, in regional nodes across the country uh, within each state. And because one of the things we also want to make sure we do is that we partner with faculty and engagement people that are already embedded in these communities. And so I think it's a great opportunity. We're just getting started and certainly would like your, would you, like your help. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Gavin. Next up, I'd like to introduce Kayla Breland, who is the Southeast Regional Preparedness Coordinator for NOAA's Disaster Preparedness Program. Her experience is in emergency management at the local level and building health equity in vulnerable communities. Kayla, thanks. Awesome, thank you, Meredith. Um, so to kind of expand on uh, Gavin's talk, just kind of talking about resources that are uh, within our, our region. Um, I do represent uh, NOAA Disaster Preparedness Program. I'm gonna be talking kind of across the spectrum of NOAA today and the resources that are provided. Um, so I'm gonna share those array of resources, which I hope will kind of set the stage for conversations um, about uh, future collaboration and support opportunities. So my role within NOAA Disaster Preparedness Program is to really link those scientific and technical expertise, resources, and services to our partners across the Southeast and Caribbean. We're looking forward to really expand uh, NOAA's role in the recovery space. So I'm gonna to touch on five categories of resources today, but I'd like to kind of start with NOAA's mission uh, to really provide that frame of reference. And that is to understand and predict changes in climate, weather, oceans, and coast, share that knowledge and information with others, and conserve and manage coastal and marine ecosystem and resources. So really, it's really gonna underpin everything that NOAA provides. And of course, as a commerce agency, we're really looking through that economic growth lens. So we're gonna start with data analysis and visualization tools. So on any given day, NOAA co collects roughly twice the volume of data that the entire printed contents of the Library of Congress. So there's really a lot that the agency can offer here. This includes forecast projections and historical data on weather, water, climate, and hazards that can support long-term recovery planning and near-term decision making. Coastal and marine environmental and geophysical data so that's a number of habitat and species monitoring programs, and again, that are relevant for that planning. Ocean use and planning and coastal socioeconomic data. And for our partners, just as much as the raw data is important, are really are those tools to analyze and visualize it. So NOAA offers a wide variety of mapping and modeling tools, particularly for inundation and sea level rise risk, as well as resources that can be used to compare pre and post event conditions. For example, we have our emergency response aerial imagery that's made available post storms. 
The natural starting point to access many of those resources is the Digital Coast, uh, which Hillary spotlighted yesterday in her, her conversation with us. Um, so Digital Coast is both a partnership and an online platform. It houses a lot of the resources that I have and will touch on today. <clears throat> and so a lot of those are NOAA products, but some of them are our partner products. So a few to highlight um, in the recovery space are our Data Access Viewer, which is a large repository of coastal LIDAR data and enables our users to access elevation, imagery, and land cover data to support risk mapping and planning efforts. Our coastal county snapshots, which include our hazard exposure, our wetland benefits and ocean economy data, and our coastal flood exposure mapper, which is a visualization tool of coastal hazard and risk vulnerabilities. So we have a lot of resources and a variety of guidance and training uh, relevant to recovery, including resources that can support our coastal risk assessment and vulnerability analysis, uh, such as our relevant uh, resilience indices and self-assessment tools and inundation mapping training, our risk reduction and resilience planning, which includes a lot of planning for effective coastal projects, stormwater management, marine debris planning, and a variety of regional state-based planning products our risk communication, which includes training and guides, building on a long history of research, lessons learned, and risk communication, especially through that weather enterprise. And of course, community preparedness, which includes our Weather Ready Nation Ambassador Program and state-specific coastal homeowner preparedness guides. So as a science agency, NOAA has a wide range of expertise that, that partners can access to support everything from pre-disaster planning to post-disaster assessment and solutions development. For example, here in Florida, we continue to work with our partners via the recovery support function to support the state through Hurricane Ian recovery. More generally, NOAA has localized expertise that can help our partners enhance resilience to floods and storm surge through the planning and projects such as levee setbacks, dam removals, marsh, coral, and oyster restoration, and living shorelines, as well as pre-consultation engagement and design support for projects, which may affect essential fash habitat and NOAA trust resources. NOAA and the agency's broader network really represents a wealth of place-based knowledge and resources. These are experts who live, work, and conduct research in their home regions. Staff, much like myself, are really there to extend NOAA's reach to the local community. We are trusted voices within our community and are deeply connected to area stakeholders. That local knowledge and networks, as we all know, are invaluable as we have the conversation on understanding what the assets are and on disaster impacts, developing those effective strategies for community engagement, really understanding what's available on the local side, and then designing the solutions that's appropriate for specific communities and habitats. So this is an illustrative but not exhaustive list, uh, but I wanna highlight a few. Our three Garrett partners, which are so well represented here today at this annual meeting and throughout the SEDRP partnership. NOAA's Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessment Program, which supports research teams that expand and build the nation's capacity to prepare for and adapt to climate vulnerabilities and change. Our, climate, our regional climate centers, which provides timely and relevant climate information to our decision makers and a variety of region-specific products and tools. Of course, everyone wants to talk about money, right? So we have a variety of funding programs that support research planning and project implementation for restoration and resilience. So these are largely our steady state programs, but they have also involved um, you know, projects that really do address those disaster caused restorations. Uh, one that's worth highlighting is the partnership with the National Coastal Resilience Fund, which is that collaboration with our National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and a growing list of partners. And those projects are gonna fund um, anything that's gonna restore, or increase, strengthen natural infrastructure and protect coastal communities while enhancing habitat for fish and wildlife. A variety of other annual restoration, resilience, and related research grants through our various NOAA programs. NOAA does have disaster-specific assistance through our fishery disaster assistance. Um, it's really important here to note that while it may overlap with Stafford Act declarations, it does not always. 
And finally, there may be some event-specific programs funded by supplemental appropriations available from time to time, such as the recent appropriations through the bipartisan infrastructure law. So I'd like to wrap up by spotlighting these three particular areas of emphasis for NOAA. Planning for future conditions. This is directly connected to NOAA's mission and, of course, an administration priority. NOAA has much to offer here, including the sea level rise viewer tool and locally relevant sea level rise projection and adaptation guidance and training resources. Our incorporating nature-based solutions, which can provide substantial risk reduction, which I don't have to, to, to say to this crowd, really, um, as part of a comprehensive recovery strategy and along with a variety of co-benefits. So in collaboration with our partners, we have a range of resources, including nature-based solutions for coastal hazards training, green infrastructure effectiveness database, our living shorelines guidance, and case studies and project maps. And supporting the blue economy, an obvious priority area for NOAA. And a few resources we have here are our Economics National Ocean Watch data set and Marine Economy Satellite Accounts. Aquaculture resources and training, as well as ocean planning tools from marine spatial planning and training, and as well as our ocean reports tool. So I shared a lot about what NOAA can offer, uh, but really my goal is to facilitate that two-way flow of communication to really understand what those critical gaps are and determine where the recovery program and NOAA can grow and ex expand to provide those real solutions and real data that we need. Um, we really want to strengthen that operational support capacity for future disaster and recovery efforts. And in addition, how DPP and the greater NOAA can really advocate for those local communities and reiterate what other programmatic uh, programs are doing really to offer up to NOAA leadership to highlight and support those. So we really look forward to thinking strategically and creatively about how to best leverage the NOAA resources, and we encourage our partners to keep NOAA in mind as we continue the conversation around recovery. Thank you. Great, thank you, Kayla, for sharing about NOAA's Disaster Preparedness Program. Next up, I'd like to welcome Victoria Smalls, who is a proud um, native of the Gullah Geechee tribe, the exec and she's the executive director of the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, where she works with community partners and international, federal, state, and local government governments to preserve and protect traditional cultural practices and heritage sites of the Gullah Geechee people. Victoria, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Meredith. It is a pleasure to be here with you all in Florida. Good morning to everyone. Um, there's this African proverb that says, however far the stream flows, it never forgets its source. And I always like to say that Gullah Geechee people or Gullah Kisi people We've never forgotten that source, and we carry it with us every single day. So who are the people? Who are the Gullah Geechee people? And just by show of hands, who has ever heard of Gullah Geechee? Yay! <laughs> I love this so very much. So for those, just as a reminder to some of you, um, we are descendants of Africans who were enslaved on rice, indigo, and sea island cotton plantations or sites of enslavement of the lower Atlantic coast. Our ancestors come from rice growing regions of Africa. The nature of enslavement of isolated land and coastal sites of enslavement created a unique and deep African, with um, a culture with unique and deep African retentions that I said earlier are clearly visible in everything that we do from our arts, crafts, our food ways. So if you eat rice, you have us to thank. Yes. Music, spiritual practices, language, and the way we are connected to the land and the water. I stand here today as a proud Gullah Geechee lady from St. Helena Island, South Carolina, and that's the land of the Kasabo and, Yam and, Yam and the Yamasi people. And we have a deep connection with um, our native nations within that area and are continuing to build that in a better way. I am um, also the executive director of this national heritage area, which spans four states, 27 counties, and 12,000 square miles. 
And it feels as if we are always preparing or thinking about what's next in disaster. The Gullah Geechee Corridor was established um, by the United States Congress and authorized as a National Heritage Area in 2006 and just reauthorized um, this year um, through funding uh, with the National Park Service till 2037. Not much funding, but we are so very grateful for it, yes. And we were authorized and designated to recognize the unique culture of our people who traditionally reside in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And if I might say, it begins in St. John's County, Florida, and extends up to Pender County, North Carolina. Now that will change where it begins in every state that I speak in. <laughs> Just sharing. <laughs> so if I'm in South Carolina, it begins in South Carolina. <laughs> so our national heritage areas are managed by the United States Park Service as places where natural, cultural, and historical landscapes and resources combine to form a cohesive, naturally, and nationally important landscape. The purpose of the Gullah Geechee Corridor is to protect, preserve, and share and also to interpret the history and the traditional and contemporary cultural practices, heritage sites, and natural resources associated with the Gullah Geechee people. So as we do our work in this area, we please, 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 will you please think about us when you're doing your work. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that is a partner of the National Park Service. We conduct our work in partnership with the public, in private organizations, um, communities, of course, local, state, federal, and international governments, utilizing our management plan that you see. And this is our blueprint for all of our programming that we put forth. So this is a map of what it looks like. It says proposed boundary, um, but it extends down, as I said, all the way down to St. John's County, which is uh, the area of St. Augustine, Florida and goes all the way up um, past Wilmington, North Carolina to Jacksonville from our beautiful Atlantic coast to about 30 miles inland. This is a historical um, corridor and then where, like I said before, traditionally we have resided. So this is our blueprint. Um, so recently, uh, Newsweek named the Gullah Geechee Corridor as one of 13 United States great multicultural destinations to explore and named, we were named as one of eight United States National Heritage Areas worth visiting in AARP's travel guide. However, with climate change and sea level rise challenges and others that mount unabated, what will remain of the corridor to visit? So what we are doing with the limited resources available to us um, are um, seen in, in just about everything we do and even with me being here today. So in between serial disasters, we are doing the best we can. We educate and re-educate. We engage and re-engage and we advocate for the partnerships, um, with partnerships and through partnerships and collaborations. Okay. Um, just to name a few of those partners, we partner again, like I said, with the National Park Service, Alliance for National Heritage Areas, FEMA, NOAA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Oceana, Health, the Half Earth Project, South Carolina Office of Resilience, Laughing Gull Foundation, the High Foundation, Georgia and South Carolina Sea Grant, universities, museums, cultural centers, our community members, and we are here with the Southeastern and Caribbean Disaster Release Partnership, and we're so grateful to Heather for that invitation. So in 2022, we partnered with Clemson University Restoration Institute to plan the Alliance for Response Low Country Forum. We brought cultural heritage and emergency management professionals together at a place where virtually all disaster response occurs at the local level. With NOAA, we are implementing a transferring citizen science to underrepresented groups program on water quality assessment along the sea islands of the Gullah Geechee Corridor, which is very important because we come from farming and fishing communities. 
even when there are de uh, developments, and I know I love to play golf, however, when there are golf courses and certain um, developments in areas, um, we are at the risk of having our waters and lands polluted when you use some certain pesticides. So we are always advocating for best practices. In addition to with the NOAA partnership, Dr. Dion Hoskins Brown, the chair of the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Federal Commission, she is a fisheries um, biologist with NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service and serves as the director of NOAA programs at Savannah State University. We partner with um, universities, and and Savannah State is one of those. Um, she serves as my mentor and brings a profound knowledge and understanding um, to our organization and throughout the corridor. We also partner with CREATE and Black Communities Conference to expand the work of the corridor in areas of climate change, adapting to climate, and cultural heritage. We partnered with Half Earth Project, Places and Voices of America, the beautiful um, uh, virtual conference that they had. Half Earth Project explores places and peoples stewarding America's great biological and cultural diversity. Um, so they also are advancing the 30 by 30 initiative and this is an interim step towards half earth, their mission. In this partnership, we share the Gullah Geechee Corridor stance on climate change and biodiversity. The corridor shares our most up-to-date, as you can see on the screen, partnership program offerings, um, activities, emergency notices on our Facebook at Gullah Geechee Commission. So we encourage you to follow us if it is appropriate for you to do so. Not only do we promote um, festivals and help to support our communities economically and educate them, we are also bringing awareness to the most urgent um, information regarding being prepared, what to do during a crisis and a disaster, and how to recover. So we publish also the Gullah Geechee newsletter to highlight the work we are conducting with our partners across the quarter and reshare steps to prepare for hurricane and flooding um, for each corridor state. After several community engagement gatherings and advocacy, the Gullah Geechee Corridor, its federal commission, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency partnered to release a FEMA update, changes in rules to disaster relief assistance and heirs property. Heirs property is something that exists throughout the Gullah Geechee Corridor and throughout the United States, and this is a vulnerable point for us within our community. We partnered to deliver special content on FEMA's policy changes to benefit three main groups, public assistance programs, faith-based and community organizations, and individual and housing assistance. We were really grateful for our federal commissioner, Deanna Hoskins Brown, and our corridor team in taking the abundance of information and data that FEMA supplied to us and fixing it in a way that is digestible for our community members. It is a 14 page document still. And so there's a lot that we still have to do within that to make it digestible for our community members and for me. <laughs> so, yes. So section 408 of the Robert T. Stafford um, Disaster Relief and Recovery Assistance Act authorizes FEMA's in individuals and household pro programs um, or program to provide assistance to ele el eligible individuals and households that are uninsured, underinsured, and who are affected by a disaster who have serious needs. The corridor and FEMA provided a breakdown of the federal terminology in more general terms for us. The corridor continues to offer FEMA's updates in multiple ways. It is often shared in our newsletter, on our social media platforms, and lives on our website's homepage. And you can download a copy of this at gullagichicorridor.org. We also have partnered with businesses, faith-based institutions, houses of worship, and partner 
with organizations like the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce to deliver hard copies of the update into the hands of community members and provide information sessions and gatherings to Gullah Geechee communities. Faith-based institutions like the Balmain Gilead, which is an international health min ministry, partnered with the Gullah Geechee Corridor to share our video message at their international virtual conference on the impacts of climate change on Gullah communities in the southeastern United States. So I really want us to be clear uh, when we think about how we partner with community members and to understand that we are all in this together. We are all in this climate crisis together and the impacts of sea level rise include and are challenges for us and they include coastal erosion, storm surge flooding, coastal inundation, salt water infiltration, loss of coastal properties and habitats, decline, declines in soil and freshwater quality, loss of transportation routes, loss of economic, economic sustainability, loss of food, loss of communities, declines in our health, and loss of life. As Prime Minister Mia Amora Motley of Barbados, my idol, yes, she's fierce and a force of nature, stated to the world, we do not want that dreaded death sentence and demands us to try harder, try harder. There's much we can do and must do. Let's connect, let's partner. And in closing, in my first language of Gullah, I gladi de biwa una de day, I hope for see una in the land of Gola Kisi. Thank you, thank you. I'm glad to be here with you today. I hope to see you in our land of the Gullah Geechee Corridor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victoria. Thank you for giving us an update of the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor and all the important work you guys are doing. Lastly, our last speaker, I'd like to introduce Ivan Baez, who is the Director of Public and Government Affairs of Walmart in Puerto Rico, where he develops and implements Walmart's corporate affairs strategies and projects focused on local farmers, small business development, and sustainability. Ivan, thank you. Thank you for inviting me and good morning to all. Uh, I don't have a presentation, I just wanna share more my experience based on the last hurricanes that passed through the island. I have a video that I wanted to share with you first, then I'll start my, my learnings and my recommendations. El huracán María causó daños extremos en la tienda Walmart de Humacao, dejándola totalmente destruida. Frustrante, desesperante y dan ganas de llorar cuando vimos la devastación que María ocasionó en esta tienda y en el centro comercial. Pero nuestros asociados fueron los primeros en llegar a la tienda para ponerse a trabajar de inmediato con mucho entusiasmo y optimismo. Para seguir sirviendo al pueblo, instalamos una farmacia y una óptica temporera y hasta un mini Walmart con los artículos que más se necesitaban en el pueblo. Walmart está presente en la reconstrucción de Puerto Rico. Por eso, para ayudar al pueblo a levantarse, decidió invertir 10 millones de dólares para remodelar totalmente su Walmart Supercenter de Humacao y estar listo para ofrecer los bajos precios de siempre. Fue una emoción bien grande para mí eh, que la compañía determinara eh, reconstruir la tienda. Y a menos de 200 días del paso del huracán, Walmart Humacao abre sus puertas. Una tienda espectacular con los últimos eh, tecnologías en el sistema, vamos a tener self-checkout para que usted se cobre usted mismo. Increíble Macao, tu Walmart está de pie, listo para servirte. Well, this is an example of one of our stores that were completely destroyed during Hurricane Maria. Basically, basically, Walmart in Puerto Rico is the largest employer in the island. We have over 13,000 associates. Uh, and also, uh, we have the, we're the largest uh, 
su support of local manufacturing and local farmers as well uh, as part of our corporate social responsibility programs. Uh, based on our experience with disaster management, uh, Walmart used to have an EOC and also have uh, activated the Walmart Foundation and the communications team. Uh, basically, I'm based in the island, but I received support from the mainland as well in terms of uh, the foundation and the EOC. First, we started during hurricane season. What we do, retailers do, we do preparedness. Uh, during hurricane season or prior to hurricane season, all the retail industry and supermarkets buy uh, uh, first aid products in order to prepare for hurricane season. Uh, this is part of the standard operating procedure because we are in a hurricane alley and we're used to uh, have so many messes or uh, being impacted by hurricanes. Uh, in, in the case of uh, rapid, we do uh, preparedness, then we do, uh, in the case of an impact uh, assessment, and then rapid recovery, and then opening. This is, in theory, what looks like the fine uh, way to to operate, but I'll tell you my experience based on trying to apply those buckets into the reality of what happened with Hurricane Maria. Hurricane Maria impacted the <laughs> island, and there were over 3,000 people that died because of the situation. Uh, we were out of the grid for six to eight months, so it was quite a challenge. So the day after the hurricane, uh, we were hit, uh, there was no energy in the whole island, no telecommunications. In our case, we needed to uh, regroup. We went to the, uh, uh, the management went to the home office. The office was completely destroyed. So we have to go and define another store in order, in order to, to have like a, a supplemental home office in order to reorganize ourselves. So based on that, uh, we went to a Bayamon store, a north, east, uh, north, uh, a part of the metro area store in the north part of the island, and then we started to reorganize, make the assessment. We have satellite phones. The satellites didn't work, <laughs> so it was quite a challenge. Uh, some parts of the island uh, were without Wi-Fi or without uh, any kind of communication, so we have we have to go some to the highways in order to try to communicate ourselves in order to gain some signal in, and try to, to establish communication. One store, as you see, fully damaged. That was completely destroyed. The eye of the hurricane entered through this area. Uh, so we need to regroup uh, the, the management, our associates, and reopen. The good thing is that we moved so fast that within three days, like 99.9, .9 except Humacao stores, reopen. This gives the population the sense that we're back in business and that things are going to be recovered. Okay, uh, we activate our uh, BEOC, and this is the business EOC that we have in Puerto Rico with different sectors. I'm also chairman of the of the of the board of the retail association, and I represented. Uh, the retail association in this EOC, B, in the VOC. So uh, we start to have daily meetings with the government, with federal government, and uh, to, with the uh, local government in order to organize how are we going to be working in the recovery of the island. Because many of our stores, uh, and in the case of the retail industry, we are prepared, different from maybe in the mainland, to have large generators who can work for like five to seven days, but we need diesel to uh, continue operations while things happen. So we went to the uh, meetings with the government at the Puerto Rico Convention Center when they, where they established the, the EOC. And then we started to have those meetings in order to be considered tier one. There was some sense of, uh, you know, there's learnings from this because uh, some sectors were in, in the rat race for obtaining diesel, uh, and we needed to make ourselves clear that the retail sector is tier one because we provide food and supplies during the crisis. So we were able to gain supply tier one status after many discussions, 
and then we were able to start to receive diesel on a more uh, regular basis. In Puerto Rico, to give you an example, the retail industry uh, have more than 215,000 uh, people working in the industry. Uh, 100,000 of them works in, in, in chains, which are the main part of the Puerto Rico Retail Association. So basically, uh, we will start working with uh, Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority and with uh, Puerto Rico Aqueduct and Sewer Authority uh, in terms of recover uh, energy or have at least uh, a sense on when stores will be re-energized because our, uh, our engines, our uh, diesel uh, uh, engines were just starting to die because of the excess of, uh, of use. Uh, also, we work with Ports Authority because at some point uh, there was a, uh, an issue on the distribution. Uh, in this moment, uh, FEMA took control of the ports and uh, we needed to work with FEMA as well as a learning uh, in order to uh, release the drivers and the uh, the, t the control of the trucks in order to merchandise to supply because there was a lot of scarcity. Uh, also, we have to work with lots of waivers in order to bring more and more merchandise to the island because it is overregulated by local government. And finally, uh, with the Walmart Foundation, we were able to donate uh, nearly $7 million in terms of uh, aid to local organizations mostly to the food bank and the Red Cross. So what are the learnings? Uh, in this case, uh, it is very important to have a general emergency management plan and have a clearly clear lines of command, uh, not from the private sector, but from the local and federal government, that's a learning. Uh, the retail sector should always be included as a tier one. Uh, the recovery sector only because of the distribution of food, water, and basic necessities. And we help eliminate the uh, perception of scarcity. Also, another learning, Jones Act. Uh, we were receiving an exemption of 10 or 12 days. In these cases, we need at least three to, three to six months in order to uh, make negotiations with other uh, uh, lines with other ships in order to bring merchandise to the island. This takes time. Also, we need to eliminate the tax on inventories. It's incredible that in an island, uh, you pay tax for, for your inventories. This is why in Puerto Rico, we have only uh, merchandise for 30, 20 to 30 days. We are always rotating and receiving chips every week, every week, every week in order to avoid paying more and more taxes with the government. And it makes no sense, neither uh, for the population, neither, neither for the private sector. Why in an island do you have to be punished because you're trying to have merchandise in your shelters? Makes no sense. Also, my other recommendation that we, that we made is do not ration food and do not prolong the, the price freeze orders. If you try to ration food, you create more scarcity. There was food flu, uh, coming to the island and there was no need of price freeze. And talking about the regulation, uh, as I mentioned before, there's an example of the Florida executive order for emergencies that includes a, uh, a complete waiver on medicines, receipts, imports, imports of agricultural products, transport fuels, permits, bring private security to the, from the outside. Uh, this is something that needs to be addressed and we recommend it to the government. Also to uh, have uh, contracts must be managed off season in advance. That's another learning. Uh, based on the experience of Maria, and also with the earthquakes and also with uh, Fiona recently, uh, we learned that we pre-negotiate contracts in order to have merchandise and fuel supplies, uh, clean service as well, 
uh, during those kind of seasons. So basic, this is my learning and glad to answer any question after the panel decides. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Ivan. Great, well, we've got about 10 minutes and I'll open it up to the audience for questions from any, to any of our speakers. We've got one over here. The mic is coming to you. So I'm just curious, as a uh, large corporation like Walmart, do you all have insurance on all those buildings and are you struggling to maintain that? insurance coverage or is it becoming more and more part of your cost uh in our case uh walmart is self-insured so uh this is why uh we didn't have to go through a process of uh as for insurance companies great thank you other questions for any of our panelists if not i have a couple Oh, Lindy, okay. Uh, I'll just speak loud. Okay. Uh, as uh, Puerto Rico's largest employer, oh, thank you. As Puerto Rico's largest employer, that puts you in a really uh, interesting and unique uh, position. Um, you spoke a little bit about the services that Walmart provided afterwards um, and some lessons learned in that respect. Um, how, uh, how did the community react to, um, to your services and what was, uh, you're clearly building community support um, uh, post hurricane and I'm just interested to hear about some of the um, some of the community building that uh, that occurred post Maria. Yeah, uh, basically, people need supplies. Prior to a hurricane, people just take out of the shelves not only from Walmart but from any retailer, supermarket, everything they they want or everything they can in order to be prepared for the worst. And we uh, were asking for more and more inventories that needs to be shipped to the island. And frankly, we have to you know, see lines of hundreds of people every day for weeks in order to get their supplies. But we, we managed to keep people calm. Uh, we also uh, not only supported uh, NGOs that, as I mentioned, you not only to the Walmart Foundation, the Red Cross, and Salvation Army, and Feeding America, the food bank, but also the stores and the clubs need to serve uh, as freezers for uh, mother's milk because many of their houses, they don't have generators, and we offered them to bring to their stores the meal to feed their babies and put it in our freezer. So we have to go until this level of, you know, supporting the community. Uh, some, some days I remember that generators just get damaged and in order to avoid losing the food, we, we made a call to the community in order to go, go and pick for free the food. Uh, otherwise it will be lost. So those are some examples at the ground level that we manage. Great, and I believe it's time for break, right? So if you have any other questions, I'm sure these speakers would be happy to answer any questions, but if we can give one more round of applause to this amazing um, panel. <laughs>